Hey, well, welcome back to theCUBE's coverage of Cloud Native Security Con, the inaugural event in Seattle. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE here in the Palo Alto studios. We're calling it the Cube Center. It's kind of like our sports center for tech. Uh, it's kind of remote coverage. We've been doing this now for a few uh, years. We're going to amp it up this year as more events are remote and happening all around the world. So we're going to continue the coverage with this segment focusing on the data stack, entrepreneurial opportunities around all things security and as obviously data is involved. And our next guest is a friend of the Cube and Cube alumni from 2013, entrepreneur <laughs> himself turned now venture capitalist angel investor with his own firm, Ofer Kahane, managing director, Sonoma Ventures, formerly the founder of Origami Sold to Intuit a few years back, focusing now on having a lot of fun angel investing on boards, focusing on data-driven applications and stacks around that, and all the stuff going on and really in, in, in the wheelhouse for what's going on around security data. Ofer, great to see you, thanks for coming on. My pleasure, great to be back, it's been a while. So you're kind of on easy street now, you, you did the entrepreneurial <laughs> venture, you worked hard, uh, we were on together in 2013 when theCUBE just started, Excel Partners yeah. had an event in Stanford, Excel, and they had all the features there. You know, we interviewed Satya Nutella, who was just a manager at Microsoft at that time, he was there, he's now the CEO. Yeah, of he was. <laughs> Lots <laughs> changed in nine years, but uh, congratulations on your, your venture you sold, and you got, you got an exit there, and now you're doing a lot of investments. I'd love to get your take, because this is really the biggest change I've seen in the past 12 years around an inflection point around a lot of converging forces data, which big data 10 years ago was, was a big part of your career, but mm -hmm. now it's accelerated with cloud scale. You're seeing people building scale on top of other clouds and becoming their own cloud. Um, you're seeing data being a big part of it. Cybersecurity kind of has not really changed much, but it's the most important thing everyone's talking about. So developers are involved, data's involved. A lot of entrepreneurial opportunities. So I'd love to get your take on, on how you see the current situation as it, as it relates to what's gone on in the past five years or so, what's what's the big story? So uh, a lot of big story, but I think a lot of it has to do with uh, a promise of making value from data, whether it's for cybersecurity, for FinTech, for DevOps, for uh, RevTech startups and companies. There's a lot of challenges in actually driving and monetizing the value from data with velocity. Historically, the challenge has been more around how do I store data at massive scale. And then you have the big data infrastructure company like Cloudera and MapR and others deal with it from a scale perspective, from a storage perspective. Then you had a whole layer of companies that evolved to deal with how do I index uh, massive uh, scales of data for a quick querying and federated access, et cetera. But now that a lot of those underlying problems, if you will, have been solved to a certain extent, although they're always being stretched given the scale of data and its utility is becoming more and more massive, in particular with AI use cases uh, being very prominent right now. The next level is how do I actually make value from the data? How do I manage a full life cycle of data in complex environments with complex organizations, complex use cases? And having seen this, uh, from the inside of origami logic as we dealt with a lot of large corporations and post acquisition by Intuit and a lot of the startups I'm involved with, it's clear that we're now on to that next step and you have you know, fundamental new paradigms such as data mesh that attempt to address that complexity and responsibly scaling access and democratizing access and value monetization from data uh, across large organizations. You have a slew of startups that are evolving to help um, the entire life cycle of data from the data engineering side of it to the data analytics side of it, to the AI use cases side of it. And it feels like um, the early days to a certain extent of the revolution that we've seen in transition from traditional databases to data warehouses to cloud-based data processing and big data. It feels like we're the genesis of that next wave. And it's super, super exciting for, for me at least as someone who's sitting more on the uh, you know, the coach seat rather than being on the, the pitch uh, and building startups, helping folks uh, as they go through those motions. So that's awesome. I want to get into some of these uh, data infrastructure dynamics you mentioned, but before that, talk to, talk to uh, the audience around what you're working on now. Um, you've been a successful entrepreneur. You're focused on angel investing. So super early mm -hmm. seed stage. What kind of deals are you looking at? What What's interesting to you? What is Sonoma Ventures looking for? And, mm -hmm. and what are some of the entrepreneurial dynamics that you're seeing right now from a startup standpoint? Cool. So at a macro level, just a little bit of background uh, uh, of my history because it shapes very heavily what I'm looking at. Uh, so uh, I've been very fortunate with an entrepreneurial career. Uh, I founded three startups. All three of them were successful. 
final two were sold. The first one merged and, and went public. And my third career has been about data, moving data, passing data, processing data, generating insights from it. And uh, at this phase, I uh, wanted to really evolve from just going and building startup number four, going through the same motions again, a 10 year adventure, a little bit too old product, I guess. But the next best thing is to sit from a point whereby I can be more elevated than where I'm dealing with and broader in terms of the variety of startups I'm focused on rather than just do your own thing and just go very, very deep into it. Now, what specifically are, am I focused on? It's all adventures. So basically looking at what I refer to as a data-driven application stack. Anything from the low-level data infrastructure and cloud infrastructure that helps any persona in the data universe maximize value for data from, from their particular point of view, from their particular role, whether it's data analysts, uh, data scientists, data engineers, cloud engineers, DevOps folks, et cetera. Uh, all the way up to the application layer in applications um, that are very data heavy. And what are very typical data heavy applications? FinTech, cyber, Web3, revenue technologies, uh, and product and DevOps. So these are areas we're focused on. Uh, I have uh, uh, almost uh, 23, 24 startups in the portfolio that span all these different areas. And this is in terms of the aperture. Now, typically focus on pre-seed seed, some kind of a little bit uh, later stage, but this is the primary focus. And it's really about partnering with entrepreneurs and helping them make, if you will, original mistakes, avoid the mistakes I made, yeah. and uh, take it to the next level, whatever the milestone they're driving with. So I'm very, very hands-on with many of those startups. Now, um, what is it that's happening right now in the industry? Why is it so exciting? So on one hand, you have this scaling of data and its complexity, yet lagging value creation from it across those different personas we've touched on. Um, so that's one fundamental opportunity, which is secular. The other one, which is more a cyclic situation, is the fact that um, you know we're going through a down cycle uh, in tech, uh, as is very evident in uh, the public markets and everything we're hearing about funding going slower and, and lower. Uh, terms shifting more into the hands of uh, you know typical VCs versus an entrepreneur friendly market and so on and so forth, and a very significant amount of layoffs. Now, when you combine these two trends together, you're observing a very interesting thing. That a lot of folks, really bright folks, who have sold a startup to a company or have been um, in the guts of a large startup or a large corporation, have uh, hands on experience all of those challenges we've spoken about earlier in terms of maximizing value from data, irrespective of their role and specific angle or vantage point they have on those challenges. So for many of them, it's an opportunity to, no, let me now start a startup. Um, you know, I've been laid off maybe, or uh, my company stock isn't doing as much as, uh, as well as it used to as a large corporation. Now I have an opportunity to actually go and, and take my entrepreneurial um, passion and apply to a product that experience as part of this larger company. Yeah. And you see a slew of folks who are emerging with these great ideas. Uh, so it's a very, very exciting period of time to innovate. It's interesting, you know, a lot of people look at, I mean, I look at Snowflake as an example of a company that refactored data warehouses. They just basically took mm -hmm. data warehouse and put it on the cloud and call it a data cloud. That to me was compelling. They didn't pay any CapEx, they wrote Amazon's um, mm -hmm. you know, wave there. So similar thing going on with data, you mentioned this, and I see it as an enabling opportunity. So whether it's cybersecurity, FinTech, whatever vertical, then you have an enablement. Now you mentioned data infrastructure. It's a super exciting area as there's so many stacks emerging. We got an analytics stack, there's real-time stacks, mm -hmm. there's data lakes, AI stack, foundational models. So you're seeing a, a explosion of stacks, different tools probably will emerge. So how do you look at that as a, as a seasoned entrepreneur, now investor? Is that a good thing? Is that, a, is that just more of the market? Because it just seems like more and more kind of decomposed stacks targeted at use mm -hmm. cases seems to be a trend. Um, and yeah. how do you vet that? Is it, you know? So it's, a, so it's a great observation. And if you take a step back and look at the evolution of technology over the last 30 years, if you longer, you always see these cycles of expansion, fragmentation, contraction, expansion, contraction, go decentralize, go centralize, go decentralize, go centralize, as manifested in different types of technology paradigms from client server to storage to um, you know, microservices to et cetera, et cetera. So I think we're going through another big bang to a certain extent, whereby you end up with more specialized data stacks or specific use cases as you need performance, the data models, uh, the tooling uh, to best adapt to the particular task at hand and the particular personas at hand. As the needs of a data analyst are quite different from the needs of um, I know, an ML engineer, which is quite different from the, the needs of a data engineer. 
Um, and what happens is when you end up with these siloed stacks, you end up with new fragmentation and new gaps that need to be filled with a new layer of innovation. And I suspect that in part of what we're seeing right now in terms of the next wave of data innovation, whether it's in a service of you know, FinTech use cases or cyber use cases or other, is a set of tools that end up having to try and stitch together those elements and bridge between them. So I see that as a fantastic gap to innovate around. I see also a fundamental need in uh, creating a common data language and common data management processes and governance across those different personas, because ultimately, it's the same underlying data these folks need, albeit in different mediums, different access models, different velocities, et cetera. The subject matter, uh, if you will, uh, the underlying raw data and some of the taxonomies that ride on top of it do need to, to be consistent. So once again, a great opportunity to innovate, whether it's about semantic layers, whether it's about uh, data mesh, whether it's about CICD tools for data engineers, and so on and so forth. I got to ask you, first of all, I see you have a friend and uh, you brought into the interview, you have a dog in the background, who made a little <laughs> cameo appearance, uh, that's awesome. Um, sitting right next to you, making sure everything's going well. Um, on the AI thing, because I think that's the hot trend here. Um, you're yeah. starting to see the chat GPT has got everyone excited because it's it's kind of that first time you see kind of next gen functionality, large language models, where you, where you can bring data in and it, it integrates well. So to me, I think, mm -hmm. you know, Connecting the dots just kind of speaks to the beginning of what will be the, a, a trend of really blending of data stacks together or blending of models. And so as more data modeling emerges, you start to have this you know, AI stack kind of situation where you have things out there that you can compose. It's almost very developer friendly conceptually. Um, this is kind of new, um, but kind of the same concepts been working on with Google and others. How do you see this emerging as an investor? What are some of the things that you're excited about around the, uh, the chat GPT kind of things that's mm -hmm. happening? Because um, it brings it mainstream. Again, million downloads, fastest uh, application to get a million downloads, even among other the successes. So it's obviously hit a nerve. People are talking about it. What's your, what's your take on that? Yeah, so I think it's a great point and, and clearly uh, feels like a, an iPhone moment, right? To the industry, in this case, AI and all lots of uh, applications. And I think there's at a high level, probably three different layers of innovation. One is on top of those platforms, what use cases can one bring to the table that would drive on top of a chat GPT like service, whereby the startup, the company can bring some unique data sets to infuse and add value on top of it by uh, you know, custom focusing it and purpose building it for a particular use case or particular vertical, whether it's applying it to customer service in a particular vertical, applying it to, um, I don't know, uh, marketing content creation and so on and so forth. That's one category. And I do know that uh, as one of my startups is in uh, Y Combinator uh, this season, uh, winter 23, they're saying that a very large chunk of the YC companies in this uh, cycle are about GPT use cases. So we'll see a flurry of that. <laughs> um, the next layer, the one below that, is those who actually provide those platforms, whether it's ChatGPT, whatever will emerge from the partnership with Microsoft and any competitive uh, players that emerge from other startups or from the big cloud providers, uh, whether it's uh, Facebook, if they ever get into this, and Google, which will clearly will, as they need to, to survive around search. The third layer is the enabling layer. As you're going to have more and more of those different uh, large language models and use cases running on top of it, the underlying layers, all the way down to cloud infrastructure, the data infrastructure, and the entire um, set of tools and systems that take raw data and massage it into useful, labeled, contextualized features and data to feed the models, the AI models, whether it's during training or during inference stages and in production. Um, personally, my focus is more on the infrastructure than on the application use cases. And I believe that uh, there's going to be a massive amount of innovation opportunity around that to reach cost-effective, quality, fair models uh, that are deployed easily and maintained easily, or at least with as little pain as possible, at scale. Uh, so there are startups that are dealing with it in various areas. Some are about focusing on labeling automation, some about fairness. Uh, about uh, speaking about cyber protecting models from uh, threats through data and other issues with it and so on and so forth. And I believe that 
this will be a, too a big driver for massive innovation in the infrastructure layer. Awesome, and I love how you mentioned the iPhone moment. I was I call it the browser moment because it felt that way for me personally. Yeah. But I think from a business model standpoint, there is that iPhone shift. It's not the BlackBerry; it's a whole other thing. Um, and I, I like that, but I do have to ask you because this is interesting. You mentioned iPhone. iPhone is mostly proprietary. So in these uh, machine learning foundational yeah. models, you're starting to see proprietary hardware bolt-on acceleration bundled together for faster, faster uptake. And now you got open source emerging um, as two things. It's almost iPhone Android situation. Uh, happening. Yeah. So, what's your view on that? Because you know, there's pr pros and cons for either one. You're seeing a lot of these machine learning models very proprietary, um, but they work. And do you care, yeah. right? And then you got open source, which is like, okay, let's get some open source code and let people verify it and then build on with that. Is it a yeah, balance? So I, I is, it, is it mutually exclusive? What's your view? I, I think it's going to be uh, market will drive the proportion of both, and I think for a certain use case, you'll end up with more proprietary offerings. With certain use cases, like, I guess the fundamental infrastructure for chat GPT like, um, uh, let, let's say, uh, large language models and all the use cases running on top of it, that's likely going to be more platform oriented and open source and will allow innovation. Think of it as the equivalent of iPhone apps or Android apps running on top of those platforms as an AI apps. So we'll have a lot of that. Now, when you start going a little bit more into the guts, the lower layers, then uh, it's clear that for performance reasons, in particular for certain use cases, we'll end up with more proprietary offerings, whether it's advanced silicon, such as some of the silicon that emerged from entrepreneurs who have left Google around TensorFlow and all the silicon that powers that. Uh, you'll see a lot of innovation in that area as well. It ultimately intends to improve the cost efficiency of running what large AI oriented uh, workloads, both in inference and in learning stages. You know, I got I to ask you because this has come up a lot around uh, Azure and Microsoft. Microsoft, pretty good move getting into the chat GPT yep. and the open AI because I was talking to someone who's a hardcore Amazon uh, developer and they said, um, they swore they would never use Azure, right? One of those types. Um, and they're <laughs> spinning up Azure servers to get access to the API. So the developers are flocking, as you mentioned, the, the YC class is all doing large data things because you now program with data, which is amazing, which is amazing. So what, what's your take on, I know you got to be kind of neutral because you're an investor, but you got Amazon has to respond. Google essentially did all the work. So they have to have mm -hmm. the solution. So I'm expecting Google to have something very compelling, but Microsoft right now is going to just might, might run the table on developers this new wave of data developers. Mm -hmm. What's your uh, take on the cloud responses to this? What's Amazon, what, that, what do you think AWS is going to do? What should Google be doing? What's your take? So each of them is coming from a slightly different angle, of course. Uh, I'll say Google, I think, has massive assets in the AI space. Um, and their underlying cloud platform, I think, has been designed to support such complicated workloads. Um, but they have yet to go as far as opening it up the same way as GPT is now in that Microsoft partnership on the Azure. Um, uh, good question regarding uh, Amazon. AWS has, has had a significant investment in AI-related infrastructure. Seeing it through my startups, uh, through uh, other lens as well. Um, how will they respond to that higher layer above and beyond the, the low level, if you will, uh, AI enabling apparatuses, how do they elevate to at least one or two layers above and get to the same ChatGPT layer? Good question. Uh, is there an acquisition uh, that uh, will make sense for them to accelerate it? Maybe. Uh, is there in-house development that they can uh, reapply from a different domain towards that? Possibly. Uh, but I, I do suspect we'll end up with um, acquisitions as the arms race around the next level of cloud uh, wars uh, emerges. And it's going to be no longer just about the basic tooling for basic cloud-based applications and the infrastructure and the cost management, but rather faster time to deliver AI and data heavy applications. Once again, each one of those cloud uh, suppliers or vendors coming with different assets and different pros and cons. Uh, all of them will need to just elevate uh, the uh, level of the fight, if you will, in this case, to the AI layer. It's going to be very interesting, you know, the different stacks on the data infrastructure, like I mentioned, analytics, data lake, uh, AI, all happening. It's going to be interesting to see how this turns into this AI cloud, like data clouds, data operating systems. So super fascinating area. Ofer, thank you for coming on and sharing your expertise with us. Great to see you and congratulations on the work. I'll give you the final word here. Give a plug in for what you're looking for, for startup seats, pre-seeds. Uh, what's the kind of profile that, that gets your attention uh, from a, a seed, pre-seed 
uh, candidate or entrepreneur? Uh, cool. First of all, it's my pleasure. Uh, enjoy our chats as always. Hopefully the next one is not going to be in nine years. <laughs> as to uh, what I'm looking for, uh, ideally, uh, smart, dedicated entrepreneurs who have come from a particular domain problem or problem domain uh, that they understand, they felt it in their own you know, 10 fingers or uh, you know, millions and billions of neurons in their brains, and they figured out a way to solve it, uh, whether it's a uh, data infrastructure play, a, a cloud infrastructure play, or a very, very smart application that takes advantage of uh, data at scale. Uh, these are the things I'm looking for. One final, final question I have to ask you because you're a seasoned entrepreneur, as now coach. What's different about the current entrepreneurial environment right now vis-a-vis -vis the past decade? What's new? Is it different, highly accelerated? What advice do you give entrepreneurs out there who are putting together their plan? Obviously a global resource pool now of engineering. Um, you know, it might not be yesterday's formula for success to put an adventure together to get to that product market fit. What's, what's new and different? What's your advice to the mm -hmm. folks out there about what's different about the current environment for being an entrepreneur? Fantastic, so I think it's a great question. So I think there's a few axes of difference uh, compared to, let's say, five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. First and foremost, given the amount of infrastructure out there, the amount of open source technologies, the amount of developer toolkits and frameworks, time to develop an application, uh, at least at the application layer, is much faster than ever. So it's faster and cheaper uh, to most the part, unless you're building very fundamental core uh, deep tech, where you still have the big technology challenge to deal with. Um, and, and, and absent that, the challenge shifts more to how do you manage my resources to find part market fit? How are you integrating the GTM lens, the go-to-market lens as early as possible in the product market fit cycle, um, such that you reach from once, from pre-seed to seed, from seed to A, from A to B, with a, an optimal amount of velocity and, and a minimal amount of resources. One big difference specifically as of, let's say, beginning of this year, late last year, is that money is no longer free uh, for entrepreneurs, which means that you need to operate and build startup in an uh, environment with a lot more constraints. And in my mind, some of the best startups have ever been built and some of the big uh, market changing, generational changing, if you will, uh, technology startups in their respective industry verticals have actually emerged from these times. And these tend to be the smartest, best startups um, that uh, emerge because they operate with a lot less money. Money is not as available for them, which means that they need to make tough decisions and make priority calls every day, which you don't need to do. You can push this, they push, kick the count down the road when you have plenty of money and it cushions for a lot of mistakes. You don't have that cushion. And hopefully you end up with companies with a more um, agile, um, more, uh, if you will, resilience and better cultures in making those tough decisions that start to make every day, which is why I'm super, super excited to see the next batch of amazing unicorns, true unicorns, <laughs> not just valuation uh, market, uh, you know, rising with the water type unicorns uh, that emerged from, from this particular uh, era, uh, which we're in the beginning of, and, uh, you know, very much enjoy working with entrepreneurs during this uh, difficult time at times for them. The next 24 months will be the next, next wave. Like you said, best time to do a company. Remember Airbnb's pitch was, we'll rent cots in, in apartments and sell cereal. Uh, boy, a lot of people pass on that deal in that last down market that turned out to be a game changer. <laughs> so the crazy ideas might not be that bad. So it's all about the entrepreneurs and, and uh, 100%. this is a big wave and it's certainly happening. Oprah, thank you for sharing. Obviously data is going to change all the markets, refactoring security, FinTech, user experience, applications can be changed by data, data operating system. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for sharing. Appreciate it. My pleasure, okay. have a good one. More coverage for the Cloud Native Security Con inaugural event. Data will be the key for cybersecurity. The Cube's coverage continues after this break. <laughs>